And so there's a lot of conjoined reasons why people feel loneliness and isolation um, in, in the places that we study. The other reason I think is because we have an aging population in the UK and in Europe. People are living for longer, but they're not always enjoying good quality of life as they grow older. So there's more people living with long term conditions. And those could be things like diabetes, heart disease. Um, they could have a decrease in their mobility and their personal mobility. And these are the things that start to, if you like, kettle people into their own homes. So get out less. Um, they are uh, they often suffer a decrease in well well-being because of that. They stop looking after their long term conditions well and they gradually become very isolated. And, and that's often exacerbated by the death of a partner as well. So there's a lot there. There's a lot of joined up reasons why people I think it's a creeping um, it's a creeping uh, problem where people don't suddenly become lonely, but they uh, eventually realise that they are. Certainly for us, it's very much about place-based solutions. So I, I get really irritated when people try to um, just think of one single solution and apply it everywhere, because it's all to do with understanding the configuration of people, energy, resources, agencies, organisations, communities in a place and finding a way to mobilise all those things to create bespoke solutions that are and bespoke social innovations that are right for that place and that really engage people. They're led by the community and by individuals in that community um, and that and that for me is the power of social innovation it needs to be enabled in that way and that means uh, certainly in the UK that means breaking down some barriers around how agencies work together and organizations how budgets work the, the budget thing drives me crazy because you can do so much with a small amount of money in a place if you, if you give it to people and let them realise their own potential, their own ideas, their own solutions, it costs virtually nothing and yet it's so powerful. But because of the way budgets and relationships work between organisations, um, oftentimes it's very difficult to, to enable that. So, so there's very, I mean, there's great, we've seen it in COVID, fantastic things happening in a highly localised, place-based way where communities have self-mobilized, self-organized, um, gathered around people who are vulnerable um, and really shown the power of, of community-based collective organization and effort. It's been fantastic. Yeah, I think empowerment is everything actually. Giving people permission, um, or, or just not, you know, maybe it doesn't require one to give permission. Maybe, you know, empowerment is about them giving themselves permission to go and do something um, with a small amount of resource. Um, in a previous project, we've used the guided conversation to do that. That's the tool we're using in HAIR. And uh, the things that were developed out of that and seem incredibly banal and small scale and, and um, quotidian really but they they were things like um, armchair exercise groups for older people a coffee morning for a social uh, a social housing community um, there was some community gardening there was some IT training for older people. Now, those just seem like the most ordinary things in the world, but they're so important in that place to those people. Those are exactly the right things to do at that moment. Um, and you might say to yourself, well, why couldn't they happen anyway without any kind of uh, intervention? But this is what I mean about empowering people and giving and having them give themselves permission to get things started. That's what a 
that's what our guided conversation tool does alongside the neighborhood analysis tool because it it tries to uh, help people recognize the potential in that place and their power to bring change to it and it it could be small scale things it could be much more structural change that's what we're hoping for in here to really change the way services are designed and delivered so people are much more involved and engaged in that what does empowerment look like you need you need to uh i think some organizations and, and local government need to really let go of of uh, all the rules they've made for themselves and now a great example of this is one of our project partners in here Theoc Parish Council which is a very small parish council here in Cornwall um, fantastically innovative they're very willing to try stuff they uh, they don't get all tangled up in in worrying about uh, how it will go or will it work or all of that how are we going to measure it you know they are just very willing to give things a try and, and that means that there's a huge amount of energy in that community um because they they you know they already know that they can try things and and you you start to hear conversations happening where people go well let's try this let's try this how would it work how can we organize it let's let's give it a go and that's, you know, that is very, when you see that, when you see the energy that uh, comes out of um, letting go of some kinds of uh, presumptions about how things work, it can be very, uh, it's very gratifying. So the guided conversation method really is co-designed by everybody and all the partners that are involved on the project. And it, its main principles are, are, are around coming up with uh, conversational topics that they really want to understand in terms of the individuals that they target. So um, we, we held a series of uh, co-design workshops with the partners on the project and, and we came up with um, 20 topics. Uh, which we've then split into being place-based, about the person, and then um, things that might help uh, uh, the empowerment of that person, such as how included they feel in their local area, um, and their sort of how able they are to practice their personal values. So we've got a conversation structured around 20 topics. Um, however, we, 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 we veer away from structured questions around those topics. So they're asked in a really, really open way. Uh, and, and, you know, we recommend that two hours is given to the uh, method, but sometimes they can last much longer uh, and, 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 and they do. Um, so that's, that's sort of the method as a, as, as a um, sort of you small package there in terms of being a collection of topics that are agreed by the partners and asked in a really um, open way. But then what we get individuals to do is um, give themselves a score, uh, which is completely subjective in relation to what they've spoken about a certain topic. And that really acts as a um, summary process to see topics where um, individuals are scoring lowly and, and not feeling great about. So that then uh, provides a lead-in to prioritise those topics that they've scored lowly um, to come up with some uh, actions that are possible in the local area. And where we usually start it are things that that individual can do. And then build up the conversation around how that might be supported, what they might need to, um, you know, uh, do that activity that might mitigate some of the areas of the guided conversation they themselves have scored themselves lowly in. Um, and then what happens is that an action plan is agreed between the individual and the person conducting the guided conversation. Um, and um, that sort of left as a, um, a joint action plan for the both of them. So there might be something in there for the social worker or volunteer to support the individual with, 
but there will be things in there as well that the individual can do um, themselves. Uh, and then ultimately that those activities are left to the individual to sort of carry out and the social workers to support with. Mm. And six months later, there's a follow on conversation to just have a recap about those topics of the guided conversation and whether they've changed the tool and whether the action plan out of that in-depth conversation, which is, as you can imagine, really unique to that individual, has worked and whether they would change anything. Nou, die guided conversations, die kunnen een hulpmiddel zijn hè, om, om sneller tot, de, ja, tot een echt gesprek te komen en het ook aan te durven gaan. En, en voor ons is het dan ook, van, ja, als meer mensen dat willen en daaraan gewend raken, ik hoop ook dat dat dan hè, voorbij het oppervlakkige kan gaan. En dat we dan op die manier ook echt mensen kunnen bereiken en meer zicht kunnen krijgen op hoe gecompliceerd dat eenzaamheidsverhaal eigenlijk is. In plaats van tot hele snelle conclusies weer te komen. Hè? En denk ik ook van dat soort kennis en kunde. Hè? Hoe mensen gewoon eenvoudigweg met elkaar omgaan. Kunnen ook weer welzijnswerkers of andere professionals leren. Hoe zien die netwerken eruit? Hoe, hoe blijven die contacten ook tot stand staan? We hebben ook bijvoorbeeld in één kern, um, of eigenlijk een, een, een heleboel kernen samen, hebben ze zo'n uh, tafeltje dekje-achtige constructie. Maaltijden worden bezorgd door vrijwilligers. En uh, naast die maaltijd wordt er ook eens een, een, een lampje vervangen en, en een rekening mee uh, betaald. En er wordt dus een gesprekje gevoerd. Dus dat is een ontzettend belangrijk uh, soort iets. En in één zo'n kern had je daar Annie. En die zorgde voor alle vrijwilligers. En wat Annie zei, die fietst gewoon door het dorp. En ze had gezien, daar is weer een man met pensioen gegaan. Ze zegt, nou, ik wacht gewoon tot hij zijn heg een keer aan het knippen is. En ik fiets daar langs. En ik zeg, van zeg, heb jij nog tijd over? <laughs> en hij zei van, ja, tegen haar zeg je ook geen nee. Dus ja, <laughs> hij is dat al gaan doen. En dat soort netwerkvorming, hè, hoe dat werkt, dat contact met elkaar en waarom je iets wel doet en niet. Ik denk ook zelf dat professionals daar nog enorm veel van kunnen leren. En dat wij met elkaar veel meer aan moeten sluiten op hè, hoe we met elkaar omgaan en hoe je elkaar vindt of niet vindt daarin. En dat ook professionals die kennis uh, enorm uh, mee kunnen nemen in hoe we dit, ja, dat, dat dilemma rondom eenzaamheid en alle daaraan verbonden problemen uh, met elkaar uh, aan kunnen pakken. En het is ook wel een misverstand dat, denk ik, dat, um, dat ouderen, als, als jij alleenstaande ouderen bent, dan ben je eenzaam. Ja. Dat wordt heel vaak zo gezien, hè. Dan, ja, en Petra heeft daar wel een mooi verhaal over, over die mevrouw die uh, achter dat raam zat en die andere jonge mevrouw die daar steeds langskwam. Ja, ja, we hadden interviews gedaan, ook met studenten hè, in een dorp. En uh, dan gingen we allerlei mensen spreken. En ook in dezelfde straat. En daar wonen jonge mensen met kinderen en die... Uh, die mevrouw zei van nou onze buurvrouw hier op het hoekje, die is zo ontzettend eenzaam. Als ik ochtends mijn kinderen naar school breng en smiddags weer uh, ophaal, dan zit zij acht, altijd zo zielig achter dat raam. En uh, nou, is waar je dan maar? Toen gingen we die mevrouw interviewen en die zegt, die mevrouw zegt, ik amuseer me toch zo kostelijk. Ik puzzel eens wat en ik drink ochtends mijn koffie en thee. En ik wacht elke dag tot de kinderen langskomen van school, want daar geniet ik zo ontzettend van. Die vrouw was helemaal niet eenzaam. Maar ze genoten wel van. En dat hebben we ook met elkaar gedeeld, die, die verhalen. 